let's go ahead and announce our speakers for today. So we have two of them again, just like last time. Um, Radmila Popovich has been active in the field of ELT for more than 30 years as a teacher, teacher educator, university lecturer, and consultant. And uh, before moving to Washington DC in 2011 to work as an education and research specialist for world learning, she was an assistant professor in ELT methodology and applied linguistics at the University of Belgrade in Serbia. And she has worked on many different innovative projects like teaching English to young learners, teacher development at primary and secondary levels, mentoring and curricular reforms and different things like that in many different countries, including Algeria, Egypt, El Salvador, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Serbia, Tunisia, Turkey, and the United States. So uh, she has lots and lots of experience that she's going to be sharing with us. And she also has an online course called Teaching Grammar Communicatively that is part of the online professional English uh, network program. And she has professional and research interests in teacher education, e-learning and teaching and second language development. And her co-speaker, co-presenter is Neil O'Flaherty. He's an education specialist with over 30 years experience working in and with institutions of higher education including more than 10 years working in EFL teacher professional development and in providing technical assistance to education institutions um, as uh, the senior TESOL advisor at World Learning in Washington, DC. And through this work, he has gained famili familiarity with uh, education contexts in several different countries in North Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But before joining World Learning, he taught French, and uh, French for specific purposes at college in Ireland. Uh, he taught English in France and general academic English to international students in the United States. And he's also taught languages at middle school and high school in Ireland for a number of years. And his current areas of interest include curriculum development, online teaching and learning, and EFL teacher training and professional development. So the two of them are here to speak with us today with the presentation, Supporting Students in Online EFL Courses, why, what, and how. So if you have your camera on, can you please help me welcome Radmila Popovich and Nilo Flaherty with a warm virtual applause or mm -hmm. shaking of the hands. So take it away, Neil and Radmila. All right, so I think Neil is gonna take it away first. Is that right, Radmila? That's right. Take it from the top, right? There we go. So, the, the title that we gave Mark and Jonathan and the others for this particular talk, we gave it to them probably about six months ago. I'm not sure exactly how many months, but a shocking number of months ago. And so much has changed and so much has not changed in that time in relation to teaching online that we really had to puzzle as to what was still relevant, what had become irrelevant. We had to make assumptions that lots of you guys have online experience now you did not have when we made this proposal. And so I think the best we can say is that we, we hope at least that the structure of what we have put together to share with you today from our own experience um, resonates in some way and will support you in some way. Maybe not every aspect will, but some will, we hope. So it's very difficult to know exactly where to pitch this given how much experience people have gained. So, however, let's take it away from there. So on that first slide, we have three kinds of questions. What do our students need support in? Why do our students need support right now? What kind of support do they need? And how can we provide that support? So that is essentially the context in which we're going to present what we're presenting today. I suspect you can all give your own answers to those questions um, in relation to what you know about teaching online, what your experience is of teaching online, or having your own children maybe studying online. But let's explore them together and see what we can um, see what we can share, see what ideas that generates. And at the end, there will be plenty of time, I hope, for an open discussion on precisely these three questions, but also on the activities and the practices that we want to share with you. And I think in some ways, 
that is exactly what we want to do today. We want to share with you some good practices and some activities. Though this is only a 90 minute session, so we're not going to share hundreds of amazing activities, but we're going to reference some and share a small number. Uh, the slides I understand from Mark and the bibliography and so on will be available for you later. So uh, at the next slide then, Radmila, maybe just to highlight these key points, we've decided that it's best to look at this question of why and how and what support we can give our students by breaking it down somewhat into support in relation to technology, support through using really strong, good pedagogical practices, which might come natural to us in the classroom, but which we have to consider carefully and manage differently if we want to apply them online. And thirdly, this, what I'm going to call a kind of a mishmash of social and emotional learning, building community and humanizing the online context. So three distinct areas, though you will accept our apology in advance if there's a certain amount of crossover because there's nothing that can be really divided into discrete boxes as we know in teaching and education. So that's pretty much it. First of all, Radmila is going to look at technology and the pedagogy piece, and then I'm going to come back later and look at the social and emotional community development and humanizing aspects. So over to you, Radmila, and I think you plan to start with something to make these folks wake up at the end of a busy Friday. Thank you, Neil, yes. Yes, this is something that is intended to, you know, help you wake up or energize you. Uh, it's the end of a probably long week for all of us. Um, so let's start. Let's look at where you, your students are with regards to teaching and learning English as a foreign language uh, online. So I'm going to uh, start with asking you a series of yes, no questions. Um, and um, I would like to ask you to respond to, to these questions. And there are two ways that you can respond. For, the usual one is just to use the chat option. So typing yes, no, or somewhat, if you are in between yes or no. Um, but you can also respond you know, using gestures. So if yes, raise your, raise your right arm and wave. If it's no, left arm and no. And if it's I don't know, just shrug your shoulders. So just to repeat, this is yes. So you can wave yes or type uh, yes in the chat. This is no. Type or type no in the chat. And I don't know, or it's not relevant, or somewhere in between, shrug your shoulders. Okay, ready? Are you ready? Yes? Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, do you teach synchronous sessions using Zoom or other? Yes, no, yes, okay. Most of yeses, some no's. All right. And do, and, and do you like teaching synchronous sessions online? Of course, yes, lots of yeses, yes. No, there are some no's, some, some somewhat not sometimes. Oh, I don't hate it. All right. <laughs> All right. And uh, do you use Canvas, Google, uh, Schoology, Google, um, or uh, Moodle or something like uh, me, Google, to teach uh, English asynchronously? Yes or no? Blackboard, yes, yes. Google, yes. Right, sometimes. Okay, and do you like teaching English asynchronously? 
Yes. You are a very one, wonderful, not much, most yeses. You like have or no? <laughs> somewhat, somewhat. No. All right. All right. Good. Do your students like Zoom or live sessions? Yes, no, not much. Somewhat, yeah. Mixed responses. Mm, very mixed. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right, most of the time, yes, depends. All right. Don't like it. Um, do your students like asynchronous sessions? No. They do not participate. Not sure. Some of them, no. A real mixed bag. Uh, uh huh. With regards to students, some of them, some of them, mostly, no. Okay, not at all. They <laughs> prefer being at school. All right, fine. One in the last question. Are you sick and tired of a teaching remotely, the distance or hybrid classes? No, absolutely. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh a wow. Mix. Oh mix. A lot of yeses. Oh, a, mm -hmm. a lot of yeses. <laughs> where we are all tired. Oh <laughs> do hybrid at school. Mm. Yes. Take Please me take me back to school. To school. <laughs> Yes, we are all tired. We are all tired. Challenging, yes. There, so there are still a lot of challenges. So um, as we can see from your responses, most of you teach both and you, you can teach, uh, you like teaching, you uh, combining synchronous or asynchronous sessions, most of you, but students, I think I've seen more, uh, a lot of, you know, more yeses for live Zoom sessions, some no's and some somewhat. Uh, more negative responses whether student, uh, to the questions if students like um, asynchronous sessions. Uh, and I would say that most of us, a lot of us um, are okay with this situation, but we do want to go back to schools, back to normal, old normal. We, we don't know what's old normal, yes. So I do hope that this session will help us, you know, tap on what works, what doesn't work, um, and identify ways of what we can improve uh, to support students in the areas they maybe don't like, or we, some, some people wrote, I don't know whether they like asynchronous sessions or not. Ways of tapping on what, what's happening in asynchronous sessions or synchronous sessions um, and trying to make these sessions more effective. So I'll first start off with technology, um, technology and technology support. So this is all about what kind of support these students need and how we can provide that support. Um, and when we talk about technology support, uh, we can say that it, students probably need uh, support to uh, how to use technology. We, we to support learning, that this is what, that's the technology support, the meaning of the word support. And also students, um, uh, we, we can talk about technology uh, in the ways that we can support students to use technology effectively. Um, we've, I've heard a lot of, you have worked with many teachers since the start of the pandemic, um, and it, it, a lot of them, you know, it boils down to, to this, whether 
and how they can support their students to use technology. So first of all, we need to know how to use technology to support learning and how effectively and how we can support students to use technology. And to answer these two questions, I think we've got to look at the following, uh, how to use technology to support learning. Um, we have to make an informed choice about what, te what technology we can use um, and how to combine various tools available um, in our context. Um, and also, uh, as regards how to support students and to use technology, there are quite a lot of uh, guidelines, manuals, tips, uh, or, or videos on YouTube that you can upload or share with your students. Um, and that, uh, and again, they can watch these and self-educate and practice on how to use technology. Um, but um, I'll, we will argue, would like to argue that, that that's wonderful and very useful, but that's not sufficient. We also need to provide students with opportunities to practice to use technology, provide meaningful practice. Meaningful practice is always important. Um, so informed choice, how do we make it? Um, I don't know whether you've seen this bandwidth immediacy matrix. Um, it, it, I saw that sometime at the beginning of the in 2020 pandemic sometime in April and May. Um, and it really helped me um, start to design uh, online courses better. Uh, because if, if you work with uh, in, in an area with low bandwidth um, versus the area with, sorry, great in the internet, it really, really, um, I wouldn't say limits your choices, but it determines your choice. Determines your choice. You, you, but it still, you still have your choice, um, and that's one thing: low and high bandwidth. Um, and there are activities with low immediacy, and, and this is again discussion board with text and images reading with text images, pre-recording audio, uh, and uh, uh, activities with high immediacy, such as audio, video conferences, collaborative documents. And you know, th thinking about bandwidth and high or low immediacy is just the first framework we've got to start with. Um, and, but we have to put that in the context because Bandwidth is one thing, uh, and what our students have and what we have. There are other things that will impact our choice. Um, and first of all, one is institutional requirements uh, and contextual limitations. Um, what does your school require? Do you have um, this freedom to choose what you want, or do, do they want you to use a specific tool? That's one thing. Um, the other thing is what students and parents inspect, I, I expect. I've heard that some schools that just parents didn't want their, their students to work offline, to work or not offline and or just to, to engage in asynchronous learning um, because for them that was not learning. Um, they wanted all teachers to uh, conduct live sessions. But as you can see from the matrix uh, that yes, this is high immediacy, but it requires high bandwidth. But do we have that high, high bandwidth? Um, that's one thing and the other, is your digit your confidence with tools? Um, uh, uh, since March 2020, uh, we have learned a lot of new tools, uh, but that learning was steep. And I don't know about you, but I, uh, when, I when the whole thing started, I, I had, you know, I would say sufficient digital competency, but they knew new tools. Uh, kept appearing and I had to uh, question my choices in for certain contexts for sure and start exploring and um, 
I relied on tools I felt confident with. And then I also had to take into consideration what my participants and students know, their level of digital literacy. We can push that, we can support that, but there are some limits of that. And then the other thing is, um, do you have an institutional support to troubleshoot? Are you fortunate enough that you have someone in your school who will call Canvas or whatever, and then say, all right, now I, I sorted this out, or help students who can't log in or who get locked out, or do you have to do it all on your own? Um, what's, what's available? So think, this is a complex thing, complex thinking that requires that's that's informed decision making. What kind of tools you're going to use, um, and what um, what in, in a way our in, uh, instinct is to go with um, live sessions because they kind kind of mirror of what we used to do in the classroom. But I would argue that it's worth exploring asynchronous. Uh, tools because they offer a lot um, and uh, it's how we combine synchronous and asynchronous tool, tool is something um, that will contribute to our students learning. Um, and this is what we have. Uh, we have written asynchronous environments, written synchronous environments um, that you can do um, all kinds of activities. Um, and oral asynchronous environments, all kinds of options, and oral synchronous environment. So my question to you is, you now just have a look at this um, table, these four quadrants, written asynchronous, written synchronous, oral asynchronous, oral asynchronous. Um, and where, where are you? What kind of a, um, environments do you teach in? Do you combine all four options or do you predominantly teach in one? So if it is balanced, could you please write in the chat balanced? If it's not balanced, just you say, I tend to do this more or synchronous more. Yeah, we see a lot of balanced, oral, balanced, balanced. Yeah. Lots of balanced things. We tend to do balanced. Balanced. Written oral sync, balanced. Yeah, your choices will depend on, yeah, on your context probably. Yeah, as always balancing our options is always the best way out uh, because they have a lot, lot to offer. Um, so that's one thing to ask ourselves. So technology, do we balance, is our balance well or how can we improve our balance? Um, the other thing is just that, uh, to just to ask again, provide meaningful, that's the, the, the other piece is providing um, our students sufficient opportunities for meaningful practice with technology, how to use technology, how to go beyond our uh, guidelines and manuals. And I'm sharing with you here uh, one example of a meaningful practice. Um, in, in Word Learning has had the opportunity to run several online uh, language uh, English language courses, um, and um, I was just in, in charge of um, providing, uh, uh, overseeing that and um, providing guidance for the course design and also a cor course delivery. And we, uh, our experience taught us 
that it is best to start with an orientation week where students complete tasks um, in, in order to learn how to, to use certain tools. So here is the task that um, we designed to help students learn how to use Canvas assignment. So that's Canvas. Canvas assignment is a tool, very important because this is where students submit their uh, um, task assignments to be graded, um, and they can either use um, it, they can use audio video recording or they can simple upload. Um, a, a Word document they're writing it. So this is how it goes. They're, they have to read the document about how to um, understand online learning practices and expectations. So that's one part of the orientation. Um, and we want them to uh, read that and then choose three suggestions they find very useful and then send upload that in assignment. And students get points for completing this assignment because we want them to complete this and practice. And this is a great opportunity for us to troubleshoot. And we encourage students to upload paragraphs and then later on learn how to um, record, use recordings, upload recordings. Um, and before offering them uh, um, just opportunities to practice before they ha have actually have to uh, upload assignments to avoid this, oh no, I couldn't, I lost my, my assignment, I typed this. So that's, that's a way to do, uh, that's meaningful practice for using um, technology. Um, and here's another one, um, it is, students like using photos and we want to encourage them to use photos uh, and upload photos. Um, and here we also in the orientation week, we ask them to take photographs um, and upload and simply provide uh, short sentences describing these photos. Um, this task serves a dual purpose. Um, it's it's part of getting to know each other and you know the students decide what kind of photos what they want to share whether they want to take photos of their home or not or their their neighborhood whatever we encourage them to go out and walk and take photos of their neighborhoods just to move out of their chairs um and and then share photos and and learn more about each other so that's another way that you can provide meaningful practice uh, for students to learn how to upload and minimize photos because that's also, also very, very important. They have instructions on how to do that. So that's, that's technology, combining what kind of support you need and students you, support, for support students to use the uh, technology. Now let's move to pedagogy, pedagogy support. And there's just one thing that I would like to uh, share with you. P pedagogy comes before technology. Um, in other words, don't think about tools and you choose fancy tools just because they are there. Think about pedagogy and let pedagogy guide your use of technology. And in that way, you will support your students uh, in many, many ways. You will support their learning. Um, and in order to answer the question, so how we you know about pedagogy, um, what's good pedagogy for uh, virtual uh, distance learning, remote learning, hybrid learning, is just, just to ask questions, answer these questions. How do people learn? And how do people learn second or foreign languages? Um, and you know, these, the, these are four uh, things that we have to keep in mind um, just to support student learning. We, we have to provide large exposure to the target language. We know that that's, in, in other words, quality input. There's nothing will happen without that. Um, we also need to foster 
authentic and meaningful interaction. We have to provide opportunities for students uh, to talk and write to learn. Students need to use language in order to learn it, not to practice language in order to learn it, to practice grammar or whatever. They need to use language to talk to, to learn and write to learn a lot. Um, then students have to reflect on their learning. To, 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 we have to uh, guide and prompt that, to support that. Um, the, the more they are aware how they learn and what works for them, uh, the more agency they will take, the more um, they will become more autonomous learners. Um, and also to help them understand where they are and what they need to do, we've got to provide timely and constructive feedback. This is just a brief overview. I know that you know it. Um, so whatever we do face to face, we have to do same thing uh, online, virtually, remotely, at a distance. Uh, but what we have to do is just, how do we do that? How do we do these things online? I'm sure you know, you, uh, by now you have, have a lot of answers. What I'm going to share with you is are just some ideas um, how you can achieve this. Um, talking about exposure, we've got to get as just the Goldilocks, to apply the Goldilocks principle and have just the right exposure, not too little, not too much, just right. Um, and um, it, the online environment offers a lot of opportunities for us and for students, for us to curate and offer some uh, quality input, and also to be ready to accept what students bring um, because they also read online, listen to videos, or um, ex use all kinds of resources. Um, and we've, we can, technology can help them and help us um, support their exploration of, and, uh, of uh, these uh, resources uh, available online. Um, and there are ways that we can uh, uh, support their listening skills. Um, you know, you can teach them how to use CC captioning, um, how to slow down videos on YouTube. There's that option. Um, or we, uh, for students, if, if you're in a low uh, video internet, having a bit low internet connectivity, uh, there are ways that you can uh, use the CC captioning and turn them into transcripts. Not ideal, time consuming, but that's something that you can do. And you can teach your students how to do that. And th those um, who have, there's always someone who has better internet connections than others. And then they, you, we can uh, work collaboratively on providing the transcripts. Uh, reading support, yes, they can. There are so many online dictionaries. We know that there's Google Translate that they can use, and they will use even if you don't uh, tell them uh, how to use that. Um, but I wanted to uh, you just draw your attention to two very useful tools: um, Text Analyzer, Road to Grammar. Um, that's a very good tool because what you can do, you can copy and paste a, test, a text into it that you intend to use. And that road to grammar um, simply maps vocabulary against the common European framework. And it tells you, oh, you have that many A1 words, that many A2 words or uh, at, at particular level. And there's also an option um, that uh, offers you suggestions how to simplify the text if needed. So that's something that you can do um, to, 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 to check the, the difficulty level of the text uh, that you will be using. And uh, an easy way to simplify it. Um, then summarizer. Um, uh, Quillbot offers, summarizes uh, long texts. So if you just need a short text, then you can, you know, put it there and get a short summary. Um, and or the, the, this tool provides just key ideas 
that's also important if you want to um, design activities um, that, for instance, that will support student learning of longer texts. Um, key ideas are there in, in no time, um, and then they can explore key ideas and then go to a longer text. Uh, I strongly recommend exploring this um, this uh, particular tool because you can use it also to design all kinds of vocabulary activities. Um, very, very, very nice tool. So that's just the right to help you uh, help students go and explore and get just the right exposure with the help of these technology tools. Um, now we just move to more exciting um, part which is interaction. We all love interaction. This is just uh, the essence of our job. Um, and um, I would just like to share one activity that's part of um, an online course designed to help 100 Iraqi students um, improve their um, job and marketing, uh, job skills and marketing skills. Um, and as you can see, well, I'll just give you a, a, maybe some time to read, read the instructions. Okay, this is a Zoom activity designed for the Zoom live session. Um, and as you, as you can see from these directions, um, students had to prepare for that session asynchronously and they, and they were given some stories to read, websites um, and to develop ideas. So that think, reading and thinking happened before the Zoom and they were given um, options various articles to read, um, some questions to start them thinking. And now they come to the Zoom class, they will be working in small groups and they have to develop ideas for a marketing plan to promote Iraqi tourism. And they are offered um, guidelines. So um, when, if you want students to use complex language that they we want them to explore, to read, um, it's uh, all, whether it's in live session or a, a asynchronous task, it's very, very important to, uh, to stage your directions. The same way it's important to give clear instructions um, in a face-to-face -face way, um, uh, in, in, or regular classrooms. Um, it's also, this is the same thing that we need even more important to do so um, in online uh, environment. So this is just an example how you can do it. That's, as, and, and again, combine asynchronous component with the synch synchronous one. Um, the other, the other su support that we need, I think we need to, to give is, and why, my, why students, some students, or maybe a lot of students don't feel uh, very much enthusiastic about asynchronous uh, component uh, is that very often the, um, they're at a loss. They don't know what to do. Uh, okay, we ask questions and the discussion forums and they respond to these questions. And instead of um, having just a dialogue uh, an interaction between students, you have a, what I call a serial monologues. And that's not very, uh, that's not very, uh, it's good for the students to, to respond to this practice, their writing skills or some kind of, um, but not, does not promote interaction. And a way if you want to promote interaction, you need to, to, to tell students how to respond to each other. So here are, there are some you know, suggestions here how to, they can respond to a classmate's post um, and explain. And the, that's something that you, you, we usually provide guidelines. Um, and this is something that they can find. You remember that we are, uh, I shared the first activity, read how to, uh, some, what to learn, um, how to learn online or, or 
th this is something that they get at the beginning in the orientation week. And then we keep reminding them of that throughout the, and just keep supporting them. Yes, here are these guidelines um, and this is what you can do. These are your options. Um, and you also have to model this. Uh, and model, um, sometimes you will ask a question. Sometimes you will explain, you know, oh, thank you for telling me this reminds me of, and this made me think of, um, then sometimes you will say, um, yes, uh, I agree with you because, or I'm not quite sure I'm with you there because. Um, and then it takes a while and it takes a lot of training, um, modeling, and constant reminding the students to um, to do this. And also, um, what also helps is just uh, to, to tell students who are doing a good job, fine, thank you. I, this is a good response, keep doing it. And in an asynchronous environment, you can do it directly in a discussion forum to signal to others, yeah, this is a good post, or you can do it um, in, in when you, if, if that's um, uh, a graded task, then you can, you have comments, you can contact that student and really praise for for good responses. This is what they also need. This is also part of support, telling them what they're doing right. Um, and ref now we are moving to reflection. Um, reflection, that's, that's what's, what's really good about um, the asynchronous environment, um, asking reflection questions to, to um, asking students to tell you what worked for them, what didn't work for them, why in a particular session. Um, and what I'm sharing here with you um, is just, it was a review week when we had a lot of review activities, um, pushing students to go back and revisit um, their posts, um, their peers posts or recordings and you know, learn from, from student input, each other's input, because someone's output becomes um, a collective input. Um, so here we, we um, wanted students to look at their contributions and assignments and identify some mistakes and to just to think what they learned and how they can use stepping stones for further learning, uh, engaging them in, in reflection. Uh, in helping them become uh, uh, autonomous learners. And the last component is uh, feedback, something that uh, uh, we, we tend to give feedback um, and telling students whether uh, they completed something well or not so well. Um, I'm, I would like here to just share with you something that I learned from John Hattie and his book, Visible Learning. Um, he distinguishes three levels of feedback. Um, he says that teachers have to uh, feed back, that's in the past, um, and, but there's also feed up present. Um, and most importantly, feel forward, tell students what they need to do next. Um, and if you can also ask your students, how, how they like to receive feedback because you have more options um, in, in the online environment. Um, you can audio or video record your feedback or you can um, write it, um, or if it's a written assignment, you, you, or you, you can share the Google Docs, insert comments. Plenty, plenty of options there to vary uh, the, your feedback uh, format, how you give your feedback. But what, what's really important for students to feel supported and to feel uh, uh, more uh, um, energized and motivated to complete the task is just to be very sure where they are, um, where they are in terms of what they have achieved, um, what, what was good and what can be improved. And most importantly, tell them this is where what you need to focus on. This is what you have to improve, learn more. So enough of pedagogy.
it's time for a more exciting part, breakout rooms. Um, I talked about four components, but um, again, I um, will try to do more of, uh, with less. Um, and I decided to focus on student interaction and student reflection because I feel that this is something that if we get this right, other things will somehow follow naturally. Um, so uh, Mark will put, put you uh, in breakout rooms and in your rooms, um, think about the following. You've got to think about three ways of using technology to support student interaction and three ways uh, you can use technology um, to support student reflection. And when we go back after 10 minutes, we'll share some of, of these ideas. Okay, so I've just shared in the chat a link to this, a screenshot of this, in case you, you forget what it is you're asked to do. Um, so I'm going to put you in groups of uh, around six or seven people so that if anyone is not able to speak, there will at least be quite a few people in each room and we'll be able to talk. And as always, we'd like to remind you just to really take advantage of this time to get started and interact with your partners. Um, I think that's what really makes these speedy talks interesting is the fact that you can interact with each other. So we'll open up these rooms and we'll be back here very shortly. So go ahead and click on that link if you have not done so already. And we're opening the rooms in three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we would like to you know, spend some time sharing. Um, how many groups did we have, Mark? I think we had 14. 14, okay. Could someone from group nine tell us what they discussed and share some? Sure, let's do it. yeah, we're gonna make it possible for you to open your uh, microphones. Just be careful here that you are really from group nine. So that would be Ana Lorena, Cecilia, Cindy Jarrett, Horacio, Kerling, Lilia, or Julissa. We gotta be conscious of time on this one too, Mark. We're running out of time badly here. <laughs> okay, any brief comments from group nine? Well, we were talking about um, different sites that we use. Like, for example, uh, Horacio was telling us about Flipgrid. He uses it in order to, you know, support learning and for students to interact and also, I guess, to reflect as well. And I don't remember her name, but it was uh, one of my colleagues who uses Drive as a blog. I don't know how, I'm curious about it, but it sounded like a very interesting way to do it. So she could have like a thread of discussions there. So students could, can interact and reflect upon what they have just discussed. Okay, thank you so much. So we don't have that much time to share, but I, I'm sure you had great discussions in your rooms now over to Okay, um, thanks, Raddy. Thanks, everybody. Sorry for bullying you off the floor, Radmila, but I'm just looking at the clock here and thinking, oh my God, how are we going to finish at 6.30? And we have to. So um, that was great. Now, part three of today's talk is the part where we're going to look at social and emotional learning, building community, and what is being called now humanizing courses. And I think it's really worth looking at these two quotes here. Um, one is from the, I forget exactly what it's called, the Center for Social and Emotional Learning. It's a good website to check on. Uh, it's not a website that tries to make you into the school psychologist or tries to make you a specialist in social and emotional learning, but it definitely helps you to come to grips with some of the issues that students are trying to deal with. And as they say quite rightly, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated or made even worse 
feelings of isolation, stress, loss, and more among young people, among adults, and families, and communities. So that is probably the background in general as to why we want to offer some kind of social or emotional or community support to our students in the online environment. And the other quote that's on there from whom I cannot remember, but I just think it's wonderful. It says, concepts don't stick in stress. So from our own selfish point of view as educators, we obviously want what we teach our students to stay with them. And if they're really stressed and so on, the likelihood of that happening is pretty small. Many of you have heard of this idea of affect or your emotional state being important for learning. And we talk often about keeping the affective filter low or high and having people be calm and unstressed so that they can work and learn in that kind of a, a good mindset. So those are the kind of background thoughts behind what we want to do here. So we might move on to the next slide, Radmila, please. Now, when we talk about social and emotional learning, and this is the five minute introduction, which is probably in some ways enough for those of you who just have a, a passing interest in it. Um, the five key areas that are spoken about by most of the people who write about social and emotional learning is they talk about developing self-awareness, developing self-management skills, developing social awareness, relationship skills, and becoming responsible decision makers. Now of those five, it strikes me that the two most relevant ones for us, and since we only have a 90 minute session, are number one and number two, this idea of self-awareness and self-management. So, and I think as we think about developing these skills and we look at them more in a moment, as we think about them, like I said, we're not, supposed to be the school psychologist. We're supposed to be the English teacher who is caring, considerate, anxious for his or her students to achieve. So as we think about developing self-awareness and developing self-management skills in our students, we keep sort of one eye on that social and emotional development piece. But we also keep an eye on, I guess what I would call learning management, and we keep an eye and a focus on English. Now, I think I've accounted for three eyes there. Sorry, I really would like to have being able to use the metaphor with just two, but okay. So we have to have a third amazing eye. We keep an eye on the student's development. We keep an eye on our classroom management, whether it's online or not. And we keep an eye on teaching English. So what I'm going to do, starting with the next slide, is try to um, just suggest some activities we can use around this self-awareness thing. Now, self-awareness in this context, really, they really relate, and I see somebody posting there that they relate very much to the development of learner autonomy, and I could not agree more. But self-awareness really is in this case, I think trying to tackle being present, that the student can be present, that the student can present themselves, that the student can be brave and come into the group and be able to talk about themselves. In other words, developing their confidence. What are the good things about me? What are the things I wanna share about me? What are, so that I become an individual that others in the group know about. And it helps you to become aware of your own strengths. I could say, what are my strengths, what are my challenges, but maybe this isn't the best time to ask students too much about their personal challenges because they're remote, we don't have lots of supports in place for them, but that's the kind of notion of self-awareness. And all these activities that we have here are English language activities. They can be done in a written form, they can be done you know, in a kind of a virtual mingle, they can be done in a small group, they can be done by video responding, kids can write them in blogs, really simple things. And you can think of another 20 easily yourself. What are the five words that best describe me? That's always fun. What are my strengths? And that can be, what are my strengths in school? What are my strengths as a member of my family? What are my strengths 
as a member of my community or what are my strengths in school subjects? What's the best thing or what's the worst thing that ever happened to me? And tell us about your favorite sport or your favorite hobby, your neighborhood, your house, your dad's job, whatever it is, that kind of putting yourself forward a bit in a safe way and developing your awareness of the fact that you are a valuable person. That's what those self-awareness activities are. And as you can see, they relate to English as well as they relate to social and emotional development. Let's move to the next slide, Radmila, if we can, please. Now, you can see I'm flying through here because I don't think they need to be labeled. This self-management thing, I think is supremely important for kids, particularly for disadvantaged kids, but really for most kids at various stages in their lives, if they're going to have to work remotely or even in a blended way. And it was interesting watching you guys' reactions. The kids don't like being online. The kids, you know, don't like asynchronous and so on and so forth. Maybe some of the keys to dealing with those issues are to be found here. This self-management thing really is about making students responsible. We hear a lot about making students accountable, but they need to take on responsibility for doing their work in some sorts of ways. Now, I've taught for long enough to know that sometimes getting a student to take responsibility for their work is a bit of a dream. It's a bit of an illusion. After some years teaching, you say, oh my God, this is a dead loss. I cannot do this. However, there are some proactive ways we can kind of structure their lives a little bit. Like doing goal setting tasks. Actually getting the kid to sit down and think, well, how much, what do I want to be able to say or do in English? What differences do I want to see in me by Christmas of this year? What might be some things I'd like to have as New Year's resolutions? Um, plan your day. How much time are you going to give to English homework, mathematics homework, and whatever? Just planning, setting goals. And then if you want to make them share so that there's some level of being responsible or accountable, you can do that. You might want to get them to share with the partner, share in a small group share online in general, you know your kids. Um, reflecting on how well they did. You know, were the goals I set for myself last week achievable or was I being unrealistic? You know, it's the typical thing. I'm going to give up smoking for Lent, drinking for Lent. I'm not going to, I don't know, watch any TV during Lent and I'm going to go on a diet. Stupid, pick one of them and say, well, I'm only going to have a little alcohol at weekends, or I'm going to cut out sugar from my coffee or something, being reasonable. That's the kind of self-management we're talking about here. Radmila started the session with a kind of a, as best a shot as we could give it with the 100 people in the room uh, for some kind of kinesthetic or movement related activity to get you out of your chairs, as she said. So we had hands in the air and people nodding to the side or whatever. I think getting your students to appreciate the time they spend with their friends or on sport or on physical activities is also a very good part of strengthening their self-management, getting that balance right in their lives. And you can integrate that into your English language work as well. Obviously, students can keep a diary. They can post online about their physical activity this week. What did I do on Monday as physical activity? What did I do? You know, lots of you guys probably count how many steps you do every day because everybody is crazy about that now to make themselves so slim and beautiful. But your kids can count it in a different way. They don't need to be slim and beautiful, but they sure as hell need to know, did they walk home from school? Did they help their dad on the farm? What did they do as physical activity? Okay. And I think establishing routines is a really key part of this. Routines in your lessons, routines for the students, so that there is so much that, you know, you, you join a class online, you join an asynchronous group, and there are so many routines established already that fitting in and doing the work is much more achievable. We found ourselves there in our groups, as we always do in breakout groups, thinking, oh my God, who's going to lead this group? Who's going to start the talk and so on? But if you have the routines established, 
that gets to be really easy and there's more time spent on learning. Okay, next slide, Radmila. You can see I'm rushing through here on these social and emotional pieces. Now, another interesting quote that I found on social and emotional learning says this, key social emotional skills include focusing, listening attentively, following directions, managing emotions, dealing with conflicts and working cooperatively. Now, again, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew in this session. So what I'm suggesting is that we will, when we get to the next slide in a moment, just look at the first three of those and kind of clustered together. But you will have the slides and you can look at the working cooperatively and so on later yourselves if you want. Point made here, students who struggle in these areas of focusing, listening, following directions and so on, are more likely to be off task, particularly online. They're more likely to engage in conflicts with their groups or disrupt everybody else's learning. So if we look at the next slide, what can we do about that, if anything? And let me say here that, you know, we've all become teachers because as one of my favorite people who wrote about education, Lorty said way back in 1975, the first thing that taught us about teaching is what he called the apprenticeship of observation. We were all in school for 13 years. We were all in college for three or four years. We watched our teachers teach and we ended up teaching like them. Somebody trains us for part of the time in our lives and we change some of those bad habits and we try to hold on to some of the good ones. But 90 minutes here with me and Radmilla is not going to change or enable you to change everything you do in your, in your teaching context online in relation to technology or to pedagogy or to social and emotional learning. But what I would say to you is of what you've heard from Radmilla, of what you're hearing from me, pick one or two things and say, yeah, I might actually try to do something about that. And we get back to that in the next breakout room in any event. So in terms of focusing, how can we help students to focus, to listen, to follow directions? My first concern at the beginning of a course or at the beginning of a new semester or a new term is, do the students know what they need to take part in your online English classes? Do they know they need X, Y, and Z? Do they have what they need? Now, if they don't all have what they need to take part in your English lesson, not to put too fine a point on it, something has to change. It might be that you have to modify your expectations of being able to do the kinds of stuff with them that Radmila mentioned in her high connectivity or high bandwidth context, for example. Or it may be that you can't have as much synchronous or face-to-face -face work on Zoom or whatever as you would like, because maybe some of your kids are in a house where they have to share one cell phone with their two siblings in order to attend class. So there's a lot of structuring at the beginning. Learning what's the student's learning context. Is there a room in the house where the kid can actually be on their own to turn on internet? These things have to guide how we structure our courses. In other words, we have to say, are our expectations of these kids reasonable? Or can we structure this some way more flexibly? Then I ask, does the lesson plan help the students to focus? You know, one of the key things they say nowadays is like kids' concentration spans are totally fried because of being online and on phones all the time, because of social media, because of video games, because of all of that. So do we have enough different activities in different configurations and groupings some written, some spoken, some listening, some whatever. Do we have enough diversity in our lessons to keep the students focused, to help them to stay concentrated? Do we enable the students to listen to us or to listen to their peers? This is all part of the same question. And then how good are our task instructions and how carefully do we check that they are understood? I mean, if you give good directions and you expect the students to to be able to follow them. If the instructions are great, and if you've checked that they're understood, then they may well be able to do so. But you know, one of the things, and I don't know how many classes I've seen and observed teachers in, but one of the things that happens is somebody gives their instructions and then they say, does everybody understand? And everybody says, sure, yes, we do. 
How about if you actually ask some instruction checking questions like, okay, John, can you explain the first part of the task to everybody? And don't say, yeah, right, great. Then say, Miguel, can you explain that again? So that at least a few people in the class explain it and then you know, um, okay, this seems to be getting through or if not, we've repeated it often enough that it should get through. So these are parts, this focusing and listening and following directions are all parts of emotional and social learning, but they're all things that we can support by thinking through these issues of, do the kids have what they want? Am I making too much demand? Does my lesson plan vary enough, for example? Do we give them clear instructions? All right, so let's move on, Radmila, please, if we can. Now, this is a slide where we're going to look at how we build community in our online classes. And I'm really racing through here because we have 13 minutes left and we want some time for Q&A and so on. Um, Building community in online courses, I think can simply be broken down. Well, not simply, but it can be broken down to three kind of areas. Including and inclusion and participation. Is the kid included in the community, in the group, in the classroom, in the online space? Do they feel included and do they feel they can participate? Have they opportunities to collaborate or to cooperate? Those are slightly different things. And do they feel that they are being cared for? Can they say at the end of the day, I matter in that group, I matter to that teacher? Those seem to me to be the key concerns in building community. Next slide, please, Red Miller. What's inclusion and participation? And I'm gonna run right through these, not looking at the examples, don't have time. I like what Sibel Cesare is saying there, are the kids seen and heard? Absolutely. Okay, everybody needs to know what's going on. So be generous with your emails, your announcements, your instructions, tell the parents what's going on so that they can support their kids if they're at home and if they're available to do that. Establish ground rules for synchronous sessions. You know, you really can be firm about that, say no cell phone use unless you're using your cell phone to listen to the lesson. No multitasking, find a quiet space, put away all your paper and pens, whatever the ground rules are that you want. For asynchronous work, make the requirements clear, make the instructions clear, make deadlines clear. There might be, you might need to actually write it someplace as well as say it multiple times, but bear that in mind. Then, like I said earlier, change activities and groupings frequently. Attention spans are shorter these days. And of course, don't allow the dominant students to dominate and other students to hide. If the bandwidth is sufficient, I would totally say, insist on the computer screens being on with the cameras. If the bandwidth is not, you don't have a lot of choice sometimes, unfortunately. So that's how I see about how you can support inclusion and participation. Next slide, Rabbi, please. Okay, these are just some suggestions for the kind of activities that might support collaboration and cooperation. And you know these already, and you can add another 20 to the list. First of all, I'm saying include lots of pair and group activities. And check in on those groups. Make sure no kid is getting sidelined in the group or getting bullied by somebody in the group or that nobody is dominating in the group. And that can be done both synchronously and asynchronously, obviously. And then I say establishing teams or a buddy system. Buddy system, I'm not sure if you know that term. It's like where two guys collaborate together and one helps the other, the other helps the one. Um, sometimes maybe, even though it seems to go against the grain, you might want to give kids joint homework tasks just so that they get to share that piece of their day with somebody else. A neighbor's kid and your kid can maybe be together and do their joint homework tasks. Give them group projects. In terms of teaching writing, think about process writing so that that sharing and working together can happen. If you don't know process writing, if you're not familiar with it, Google it. It's a very interesting approach to, to, to seeing writing as a process rather than as a product, which is very satisfactory from many English language teachers. 
Kids can make YouTube videos and so on and so forth. But that notion of putting people in a team or giving them a buddy to work with, try to think about that as an option for your lesson sometimes. That collaboration and cooperation is a really important piece of creating and sustaining community. Okay, next um, slide, Red Miller, please. Now, this is the care of the student one. This is so important. This is what can you do? And at the bottom of the slide, you can see be present. That level of being present, being available. Um, you know, you, you have to have one and one check-ins with your students. And in those contexts, you know, let them say what they're anxious about or worried about and so on and so forth. Check in with them as individuals and groups. You know how if you were in school, you'd probably stand at the top of the classroom when the class was over and one or two kids would come up to say something to you. Try to find ways to replicate that because kids are missing that online. If you're in a small group checking in on how they're doing, give them a minute or two to see how they're doing. Make, it, make, make them feel like you're, that they're important to you. I say here, make yourself available after class. I think that's a kind of a, an image to keep in your mind. I think at the beginning of a course, you should have everybody's, probably the parents also, emails, phone numbers, and so on. Set up a, an email account for work only. Do not give them your private email or you will be annoyed during July and August when you would rather not be annoyed. Um, and use whatever affordances the platform provides to check in with your students. And I would say definitely involve parents so that everybody is around that student making them feel safe. Now, this check-in piece, um, Radhi, could you go to the next slide, please? I've underlined check-in there, or I've highlighted it. And I want to give you two really quick examples. This will be on the slide. We haven't time to go through it now. This is from a course that we're learning organized for early grade readers, young kids beginning their English voyage of discovery in Lebanon. And each day in class, there's this check-in time where everybody can say how they're feeling, they can discuss what they're doing, what they did last night. Everybody can learn about them and they can go to grow to respect each other. Have a read of that if you're interested in this uh, checking in process with students. I won't labor it now. Next slide, please, Red Miller. This is something similar. This next two slides are an activity which Radmila shared with me, actually, having read it in a book by Mario Rinvalucri, of whom many of you may have heard. And it's, you get the kids to think of some aspect of their learning, their online learning, and you get them to fill these sentences. You give them sentence starters and get them to complete the sentences. Like, it's difficult for me to concentrate for too long online. I'm going to try to concentrate a bit better next week. I can't focus on when I'm in the big group and so on and so forth. And you get them to write those and you get them to look at them. And then you give them what's on the next slide where you say, okay, you said all that. Now let's write these sentences instead and take what you put in the first sentence in slide one and put it in the first sentence here. It's a challenge for me to focus for long periods online. I'm going to focus for two minutes longer in the next lesson. I'm sure I will be able to focus and so on and so forth. So changing perspective there, developing their mind, their attitude to growth. Sibel Cesar has a technical point for it there again, growth of the mindset, having a growth mindset. Absolutely. Okay, next slide, please, Radmila. Now, this is the question of humanizing online learning. And I'm really gonna to have to jump over this because we're out of time here. Um, essentially, what humanizing online learning means in this slide and the next couple, it really relates to how do you design your online course? What do you put into your online course that can enable empathy, awareness and presence from you and possibly from the other students to each other to emerge and to create an environment of trust. Uh, I like this network here that you're putting in empathy, awareness and presence and you're creating this safe 
kind of fence of trust. Okay, next slide, Radmila, please. Here on this slide, we suggest some things the teacher can do. Like post a welcome video, and maybe every week or two, put a video greeting just for fun. On your slides, on your screen, use lots of color and images. We tried to model that on our slides this time. I don't know, maybe we're too old and too gray on the head to do it really well, but we tried. Um, upload your photo at the beginning so that they all know who they're looking at and so that the kids' parents know who you are when they see you in the supermarket. Post weekly announcements, sometimes do them on video. Hold regular synchronous or Zoom sessions. As Radmila said, provide feedback for the tasks they do offline. And don't forget, in feedback, you have to correct, you have to make comments on the things that are errors and so on, but please accentuate the positive. And maybe if you want, you could consider using a Facebook or a WhatsApp page for the class, but with parental consent, obviously. And at the bottom, I say warm ups because warm ups are the thing that set the tone for the lesson and they are so valuable because that's where you can really do some fun interaction which humanizes things immeasurably. Next slide, please, Radmila. What can you have your students do to kind of humanize their own environment? And again, the same thing post self introductions and updates, upload their photographs. Encourage audio and video postings. Somebody in our small group talked about using Vokaru. Absolutely. Any kind of video or audio postings can really change the feeling and take it away from the written word, which is so important, really. Again, they can also, if you want to structure it in such a way, provide supportive feedback to the work that their peers put online. Just a few words it can be in Spanish or English, or if there are people from Brazil here, it can be in Portuguese. Uh, it can also just be emoticons. Why not? Like good job, like thumbs up or whatever. And then they can give them some kind of a space if you do open a Facebook page to share games and fun and cartoons and video clips and TikToks and stuff, all bearing in mind that it needs to be appropriate, age appropriate and context appropriate, of course but that's something you can consider too. Okay, can we move to the next one, Radmila, please? Now, this was going to be breakout room two, but now we're at the end of time, but this is not something you need a group to do. You can do this on your own. Think about what lesson can you draw from anything we saw in relation to social and emotional learning, to community building or to humanizing courses that you could actually adapt or adopt either way to support your students online. Um, they are, some of these are things that, you know, you knew already. Some of these are things that may not be so familiar. And like I said earlier, maybe, you know, you're not going to change your world after listening to an hour and a half webinar, but you might tweak a few things to make it just slightly different to what it's been and maybe address some of these types of student supports, whether they're pedagogical, technological, or social and community related. Uh, Mark, do are we allowed any Q and A time now that it's twenty nine? No, quite no problem. Oh, great. We definitely have we definitely okay. have some some time for that. So okay. um, as we normally do, uh, you can put your questions in the chat, or if you'd prefer to be able to address our speakers directly, uh, we can also allow you to open your microphone. So just uh, write in the chat if you'd like to speak, or uh, or if you have a question. So let's give everybody a moment for that. Thanks. This is great. I was really afraid we had to stop at 6.30 on the button. No, no, no. We, we still have a few minutes, so there's no, no issue there. So let's see. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and allow for people to open their mics if they wish. So if anyone mm -hmm. would like to make a comment, you can go ahead and do that now. Um, hi, guys. It's Mary in Costa Rica. Mary, how nice to see you. Que gusto. Es un placer. Thanks so much to both of you and to the Centro Cultural for these wonderful PD talks. Great to see you, Mark, and so a lot of other people from Dominican Republic and Mexico and El Salvador all over the place. It's been great. So thanks for just this great overview today. I really appreciate it. You've said what it was. It was a real rapidito kind of an overview, but that's, you know. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. We all know what to expect in these sessions, right? I mean, you, you yeah. <laughs> 
So Thanks, but thank Mary. you so much. It's great, great to, to see you. you. Yeah. Great to see you too. I'm heading out now. I do actually have to leave at 6.30. Okay, say um, hello to everybody in Elinvo. I will. And thanks for coming to Costa Rica. It's great to see you all. And thanks. Wonderful. Hi, Lynn. Thank you. Bye. Lynn, uh, go ahead. Hi. Nice to see you. Thanks for this wonderful webinar. Um, I like the uh, part when you talked about um, the social, emotional awareness part. Um, the thing online is that is so, so difficult to foster mm. and because we only see each other on a screen. Um, what I've done with, um, with my, my teen students is with permission from their parents, um, I every once in a while, once or twice a week, I do a telephone call to one student. We do the telephone game. Ah. And uh, so I have a message and I call one student and, and this has all been pre-planned that every student who gets a call from one of the other students, they have a particular person they have to call. Mm -hmm. So we do the telephone and what we do is we talk about, I'll do a message about um, how someone in the class is it's their birthday today or wow. class got a really good grade on their um, the test they had for their um, English class or I say something about um, someone when someone in the class got a cat a new pet whatever it is I always throw in the message and I call one student and then that student has to call the other student and then I call the final student and say what was the message and is it always, always the same? Be, Does the cat you know, turn out to be a dog by the end? Yeah, it comes out maybe a little different sometimes, depends on the level of students. <laughs> but what they love about it is they ha can't do it by message. They can't do WhatsApp yeah. or anything. They have to say it. Mm. It's a speaking thing. But what happens is they start to form a relationship with the classmates. They start to feel comfortable talking to each other in class in breakout rooms because they have some sort of outside informal contact but it's also an english lesson that's wonderful in that english yeah and what happens is they end up chatting on the phone to their the, the person they have to call on their list and then what i do is i switch up the list so then they end yeah. up at the end of the Different semester, people yeah they have yeah. talked to everybody outside the classroom just socially not necessarily meaning for English. And right. I just that just so that they get comfortable with each other. And then when they come to class, they feel more comfortable to work with each other and open up in, in breakout rooms. That's what Thank I'm- Thank you so much, Lynn. That's wonderful. That's really good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to steal that one for sure. Mm -hmm. There you go. And that way <laughs> the, the class, the, the whole class knows what's going on with everybody. There you got it happens is when they come back to class they say oh you got your new puppy what did the puppy do you know and they talk about it for a few minutes and i allow that at the beginning of class so it's that that contact i think Great. it's um makes Mark, it is there anybody else in the waiting room there or questions or how are we doing not wanting I'm... to cut lean off but it was oh no 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 <laughs> don't worry <laughs> no we're we're just uh trying to see if we have any um any questions here in the chat? I was responding to someone who was asking about the community of practice. Um, so I don't think we have any questions no, here in the in the chat so. itself, but is, if there's anyone else here that would like to make a comment or question. Okay, or do like to... Indian and share something that you have used exactly. that is useful. That would be awesome too. We all are here to steal ideas. <laughs> Hi, my name is Keisha and I'm from Costa Rica. Um, I'm on, hello, hi, nice to meet you. This is like my first meeting with you and I, I really liked it. Um, I have a question. I, I teach to adults they, at a public school, at night school. So we don't give them like virtual lessons like through Zoom or a platform. We just send them like the self-study guide and they just they need to know how to deal with it. I mean, I don't have like the way to put a lot of stuff on the self-study guys because they told us that we can't like um, let them feel frustrated or things like that to avoid frustration and those things we have to do it very simple. But 
what I worry about is like how we are going to teach them English or what strategies can you recommend me to do to create my self-study guides easily for them, but as well teaching like the four skills. Wow. <laughs> Radmila, I'm passing that over to you. My voice is gone suddenly. Yeah, well. We can take it together. It's not that easy because um, you can't, learn how to swim outside of the swimming pool you know you need to 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 do it and think about it in order to i mean self-study guides are helpful but they're not sufficient uh, and if my recommend if why do they need these self-study guides probably to learn how to what do some um is because uh here well, at least with night school, is the uh -huh. dynamic is a little different than day yeah. schools. Um, we basically what we do is like the lesson that we would teach, uh, if they would have gone to school and learn, we need we have to do it on the self study guide. So that's for example, if we are going to teach about simple present uh, in a lesson, well, we would have to put it in the self study guide. Mm. But the thing is that we can't explain it or like, I mean, like with, we can send them links with videos. We can send them like links to practice, but not all of them has access to technology. Mm -hmm. So we also need to think on the ones that they can't do it to have like everyone learning the same stuff, but with the same strategy at the same time, it's, it's really hard. Really it's really hard. It, it's, it's really hard. So just the way I'm just thinking aloud, the first thing that comes to my mind, just as a good model, is Raymond Murphy's book, English Grammar in Use, or English in Use, where um, he really very, it's for self-study. So if you have time to do something like that, or find in, in, that book can sh show you, um, he presents on, on one page, he presents whatever grammar point it, it, uh, the, is the focus of, of the, the lesson. And um, he lose, uses a lot of very simple visuals. And these very simple visuals are helpful. Um, and they, uh, again, uh, you have to, to choose very clear situations, uh, simple and clear, and provide key questions. And on the other side, um, a page some tasks for, for these students to to complete. But then you have to come up with um, the strategy, how they share these tasks. Uh, how do how do you they check whether they what they've done is correct or not correct or where they are? Um, do they send that to you? Then you have to give feedback or or something like that. Um, so if my, my tip is just go Google Google Books. They provide you just, or, or Amazon, uh, sample pages that you can have a look um, at, at what, what that may look like and follow that. The only other thing I would add to that, and that's really useful, <clears throat> I think we don't know a lot, Kisha, yet about what your what their context is and what their objectives and outcomes are meant to be and so on. But I'm guessing that if it's a self-study guide that you can't really jump in and help them much with, that the outcomes, the learning outcomes that are expected relate really to learning vocabulary, learning grammar, and learning to write things accurately. Now, if that is the case, it's strikingly old fashioned, but it's not undoable. Right. I think right. if there were, if there were expectations of oral competency or of listening skill development, then really you'd be in a bigger trouble than you're in now. So take some, take some um, comfort from the fact that perhaps it's old fashioned and so on and so forth. But I can't help wondering if you couldn't, I mean, you'd want to check, but like, are you allowed to have a WhatsApp group with these guys? Are you allowed to do check-ins with them? I mean, those kind of questions is what I would be asking. Um, I kind of feel that we'd need an hour to answer the question satisfactorily and then another 10 hours maybe. <laughs> but, but with what time Mark will allow us, maybe we have to leave it at that. 
but thanks for the question. There was another know, hand. There up, were a couple up, more hands, Arturo, and I think we have time yes. just for those those two people. So we had Arturo and then Jonathan. If we can keep the comments and questions brief, it should be enough time for the two of you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about well, what the previous question was. I I don't know if I could now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. well, uh, don't underestimate the power of small activities and dialogues, like very short dialogues, in which you have to substitute a few words, and then you are teaching a grammar point, but there is this conversation component. Okay, so like tiny, 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 uh, a long time, it makes, it accounts for a lot. Okay, but it's like it just small conversations, turning them into the core of your classes or the, the core of your grammar points. And then it's going to accumulate eventually and people are going to be able to deduce the rules out of it. Okay, it's just amazing to see that. And there was this other thing. At the beginning of my, uh, the pandemic, I was teaching using WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups. And I created short, like snippets of uh, conversations, like mm -hmm. just tiny dialogues. And that came with the example and the grammar point, and then I eliminated some words. And that worked wonders at the very beginning of the pandemic. Then we had Google Meet and stuff like that, and it improved, and I left it out, but it worked. So doing tiny little things over a long period of time, it certainly accumulates. Thank you very much for the time, and thank you very much for your insight, guys. Thank you, Arturo. Thank Much you. appreciated. I really enjoyed this talk. Great, thanks. Well, I guess it's my time. Hi, Neil. First of all, thank you for. Oh, hi, Jonathan. Accepted. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Good. I was just wondering about a couple of things when you were discussing this thing about self awareness and this social emotional thing. Mm. Of course, you were grounding this. Uh, Thinking of, I guess, you know, adolescents and primary school students, mm, of mm. course, I don't work with that kind of population, and I mostly work with adults at, at a university level. What it strikes me is, by paying attention to what you were saying is, what is it that these people are probably feeling, especially when you have a class in Zoom, everybody's cameras are off, and not even a picture of them is being displayed. So the guess, uh, I guess like the, this feeling of isolation goes back to the teacher there. And it's quite interesting, again, like what kind of things might be happening in the minds of these people in their hearts that they cannot really show themselves on the cameras? I think that is such an important question. I'll come to it from the teacher point of view. I'm teaching a, well, teaching is the wrong word. I'm facilitating a professional development course right now for a group of faculty at a university in Iraq. And the vast majority of the participants are female and being well-behaved Muslim females, they are not comfortable showing themselves on camera. So I sit looking at a gray screen with names on it and they sit looking at exactly the same gray screen with names on it. And I can only imagine how difficult it must be for them because it's driving me around the bend. Because I'm feeling like the one that's isolated here. I'm feeling like that kid who, who needs human contact in the context of that course. So that's, that has been a really interesting experience for me of kind of, of that sense. So, you know, when I was giving the two quick examples there, the one from the early grade reading course and later the one from Rin Valukri. I was very kind of conscious in a way that I was looking at those two age cohorts that you mentioned, Jonathan. And I was kind of ignoring university students and adult learners, but I, I'm not entirely sure that the same principles don't hold true. And that what needs to change obviously is, you know, you're not going to have the same check-in with a group of six-year-olds as you are with a group of 20-year-olds. But, but the concept of having a check-in in whatever creative way you can seems to me to be really vital. And I don't know. I mean, that the, 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 the cameras off thing is a real killer for me. And I guess it's a killer for the kids. I mean, if there was even some way that, that they could flash it on for just for a couple of minutes right at the beginning or 
intermittently that you could make it into a kind of a fun game and say, okay, you guys from A to B, put on your cameras now for two minutes. And then next, the guys from C to Z, C to G or something, put on their cameras. Just in some ways to acknowledge the awfulness of it while trying to improve it, if you know what I mean. I know that's not a hugely helpful answer to your question, but that um, that's it, it's more for me the sense of community, that community trumps and triumphs over isolation and anything you can do to make that happen. So I don't know, with, with, with everybody's cameras off, it's a killer. No further inspiration, Jonathan. Radmilla may have, I suspect, though. Uh, I, I, yeah, I can only say that the, the, the activity, Rinvo Lucre activity, is something that he used with, in teacher training with teachers uh, who talked about their frustrations with students. And he described in that, this is an old book, by the way, I, uh, that's my, my, my latest uh, passion, just to go to old books and find, you know, pearls of wisdom and, you know, social emotional learning may be maybe that uh, Caring and Sharing, Gertrude Moskowitz, which was published way back, maybe 30 years ago. You can find a lot of good activities there. Or Rin Valukri's uh, own book on humanizing. Uh, yeah, the... yeah, you're right. This, this is a confident, confidence building, 1991 long time ago um yeah and he said yeah he, this is how and he provides an example how he felt frustrated with a group of of teachers for switzerland and he could not connect with them and how uh, writing you know again raging about it and then you know try, trying to do you know shifting perspective really helped him understand his feelings understand you know empathize with different ways that these teachers uh, operate in, um, and then find a way to function and work with these teachers. So I found that very, very interesting. And, uh, the, and, and yeah, maybe let's try, and you maybe don't have to use all six sentences, maybe try three and see how, how it works. But he, again, he says that he's used that very, very successfully with adults. Well, I don't want to leave anyone out, but this will definitely be the last question then. So, uh, Betty Ann, if you're ready to unmute yourself, you can tell us. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to make a comment. I'm not a, a regular teacher, but I have a Canadian foundation or a charity, and I work with a couple of schools in El Salvador and regularly am invited to join a, a, an English class and Zoom. And when I ask them to turn their cameras on, please, because I would really like to see them privately, their teacher has told me that she tries to insist, but she knows that these kids are embarrassed, many of them, about where they live yes, and yes, what the yes, background yes. is going to look like. And I think we have to be aware of that as well. That is very true. That is very, very true. I think Radmila and I had an experience of that too in a course we recently, well, recently, at the beginning of the year did in Mexico where, you know, there was a certain consciousness, okay. And in fact, more strikingly for me was in the context of working with a group of teachers of a whole different thing in Burma online, where some people lived in very poor circumstances. And, you know, I could see in one case, it was very obvious to me that the woman was working in the bathroom and there was a shower curtain pulled across and, you know, it was just, not an easy life. So absolutely. I had one student say, um, Miss, I'm looking after my little brother. So that's why I have my audio and video off. Off, right. Yeah, well. Well, that gives us just some, again, a, a challenge that we have to address and, you know, come up with solutions. Thank you for that. And thank you for, you know, starting me thinking about how mm -hmm. can we deal with that. Well, we ran a little bit long, but people stayed, and that means that they, they were eager to, to continue talking about this and hearing what you had to say. And so we want to say thank you very much to Neil and to Radmila for your time. Um, and, uh, well, hopefully this isn't the end. Maybe we can have you back someday to, for a follow-up on this. So if everyone who's got their cameras on or if you can write something in the chat, if you could join me in thanking Neil and just, uh, you know, giving a thumbs up or waving of the hands in lieu of applause. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much to, to both of you for that. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, thank Jonathan. You. Thank you. Thank it you. was great to be with Bye. you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.
Bye-bye.